Given what's going on in the world right now, we're wondering how might the current environment affect what financial institutions see on the transaction side as it relates to human trafficking? And my second part to that question is more for those of us at the pub here that might not know how things sort of work on the street. Um, is, there, uh, is there something that a way that business takes place differently during a pandemic that might affect how human trafficking presents itself to an investigator or to someone at a financial institution? So I will open it up to your wisdom and answers, folks. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a, such an honor to be here with you guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We're happy to have you, Tamia. Uh, and uh, I would actually like to start uh, offering Ronelle the floor and see if she would like to start answering and then I'm happy to add my thoughts. Sounds great. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Tamia. It's so nice to see you um, virtually here. <laughs> so my work involved in, in human trafficking is not so much on the financial side of it so i can't necessarily speak to sort of what financial institutions might see but i can tell you as far as working with survivors what i'm seeing in the shift as far as how traffickers and ways are using to exploit young women and so because of social distancing and social isolation a lot of the obviously strip club massage parlors going and meeting clients that has gone away but I'm seeing a lot of the online recruitment as far as actually doing online webcam, online sex work. And so a lot of the young girls have told me that guys are reaching out to them and telling them that it's very lucrative online work. They don't actually have to have sex with anybody. So it's a little bit more appealing. It would just be sort of self-pleasure type of things. But this is just really a way to sort of break them in, get them in, in the industry. And once they have them, obviously we know the exploitation will continue. But they were seeing a lot of this and it's girls who are pretty young. So I've had girls as young as 13 tell me that they've been approached about this. And because they're also dealing with financial insecurity and financial situations at home with their parents, many of whom lost their jobs, they are considering it. And so I've had to actually have conversations and tell them, no, you know what I mean? This may not quote unquote look like sex work to you, but it inevitably will become that at some point. And this is grooming and this is trafficking. So I'll let you finish to me because I know you have a lot more experience in the transactional and the financial side of it. Thank you so much, Renal. And you know what? I just second exactly what you just said. Um, that's exactly what I'm experiencing as well. What I'm hearing from the streets or from the, the girls that are in the game currently, that because it's not feasible right now to be in the game, uh, the pimps literally can't pay for hotels, right? So two things are happening right now. The girls that are, and forgive me for saying that, but the girls that according to the pimp, what the traffickers are worth to keep, they're gonna keep them around and they're gonna actually start teaching them to do other related crimes right now, like breaking doors, you know, uh, drug trafficking, packaging, and what home invasions and any other form of um, uh, criminal activity where they put the girls up front so that if anybody gets caught, it's the girls and not them. So that's one thing that's happening. Worst case scenario, they just drop the girls off and to let them at their own devices because right now they can't make them money and right now it's just an expense for them. So financially speaking, if you want to know how that translates, Rona Ronel is absolutely right. Things are going online right now. So the sophisticated traffickers who have places where they can set up a shop online, uh, that's exactly where they're turning to. Plus, uh, they're using the apps like Snapchat and other apps where they can actually offer online video sexual services and they still take money. So you might start seeing uh, new um charges on credit cards because these uh these um services still need to get paid so you either see charges through credit cards or paypal or you actually start seeing more pay, uh, charges through bitcoin so these are these are the things that we have heard from the front lines and see interestingly um there's another form of exploitation believe it or not 
you might gonna laugh i don't think it's funny but just the lengths the traffickers would go to and right now i'm talking specifically domestic sex trafficking and then i will switch to forced labor as well um so for example i have a colleague in vegas and she's monitoring she's an analyst and she's monitoring what's happening online so the ads are obviously decreasing but what's not decreasing is so the traffickers who have dancers for example and not escorts the dancers obviously doing online work but they also charging them to use their songs so instead of allowing the dancer to choose whatever song she wants to play in the background he's going to start charging her for his rap songs to play in the background because it's commercial for him or marketing or whatever but he started he started forcing his stable which is like i think it's 15 girls to use his songs and now he's charging extra money for them too and when it comes to forced labor um again because the work uh most of the forced labor is not most a large portion of the forced labor is happening behind doors domestic servitudes that are being slaved in homes they are working 24 7 they're not getting paid there's no difference you can't really detect that migrant workers um and um let's just stay stay with migrant workers depending on what industry they are in if they are actually in the industry that is very much needed right now like manufacturing i'm talking to several service providers right now from across north america actually who are reporting a high number of uh survivors or survivors who are escaping right now from the situation because the pressure just got way higher and they're getting in believe it or not they're trying to smuggle in even more um victims to to carry out the labor because there's so much work now in certain areas and they don't want to pay for work so again it's not going to translate right now right away what you will see is online you know purchases for online sexual ads or sexual services what's going to happen is and i think ranel will definitely agree with me is I mean we both been in a business so we know what happens over the long weekend when the man who purchased sex and can do that for 3 4 days what happens after long weekend we are busy i mean busy so my concern isn't really so much what's happening right now my concern huge concern is what's going to happen when this is all said and done and we are able to open up the fraud gates and go back to society and to normal uh because the amount of ads and the amount of exploitation is going to absolutely skyrocket that's my concern what do you think about that right now so i completely agree with that tonya um and i was i was having a conversation with someone else just on to that point that well pimps and traffickers have kind of had to maybe take a little bit of a back seat now even though they still are exploiting victims once this social isolation is over and once things go to go quote unquote back to normal i think there's going to be an absolute uptick in trafficking exploitation and i think that so many an increased amount of vulnerable young people because so many homes and families have been displaced you know if you talk to shelters like covenant house that work with at risk and homeless youth they're seeing an increase of young people homeless and this is only 1 month into covid-19 so i don't know what's going to happen if this continues for 2 or 3 months i think we're going to have a lot more young people that are highly vulnerable highly at risk that are going to be lured into this and all of a sudden you're going to see all these pimps who weren't able to make a lot of money and i think your point too to me was that they will go to other avenues whether it's drug trafficking it's b and e it's other things it's fraud but there's going to be a push to get all the girls out and have them working and making money so i completely agree with that i find that really interesting what you've said to me so you've got you've got that eventual wave but also now you've got i mean everybody's out to make what money they can now and so you'll diversify into other businesses and get um get those girls involved in other like like you said break and enter the credit card fraud i'm sure is part of that as well or or charging for songs in the background so a uh, very interesting perhaps a different financial pattern now but eventually probably a surge back to a similar pattern as before but two or three times as much or whatever multiple that is down the road 
Absolutely. And just one more thought. Um, right now, what we're seeing is that this is a perfect time, time for traffickers at any level to seek out victims and groom them. Because every single young or vulnerable are at home and on their phones. You, um, so I, I was curious, when you were talking about um, the forced labor, are you seeing people that are being brought into Canada from, from outside of Canada right now? And, and if so, how are they getting here? Yeah, so I'm talking about the population who may or may not be already in Canada. I would mainly prefer that they are in Canada and especially in the States, migrant workers that are already in the States. But I'll just give you an, um, an idea. There is still two areas in Canada where the border is wide open and they can just walk right in even through COVID without any papers, migrants uh, from Sri Lanka and um, other countries. And so they're just walking right through without any papers, claiming refugee, even during COVID. So yes, the borders, the official borders are open, but there's still two loopholes where they just keep coming in. And that's actually, those are the most high trafficked areas for human smugglers. So this is actually a really good time for human smugglers to get people into the country from the States. And they have been already in the States for the last month or two. They're coming down from New York State. Okay, so what are things for those of us, we've got a fair number of people from the financial sector, um, both um, in Canada, the UK, Japan. Um, what sort of uh, items should they be looking for now that may or may not differ from the surge we'll see coming coming up uh, as we hope for the end of this particular pandemic? Again, with sex trafficking right now, I do believe they are laying low. So I would just start monitoring, you know, um, I would I would still monitor the, the suspect, suspicious accounts, but what I would do is more is just to prepare when you start hearing in the news that, you know, we're gonna come out of self-isolation, I would put things in place and I would start putting extra measurements in place as far as monitoring and detection. And Dev, you had a question? Uh, yeah, more of um, something that might help as an answer, <laughs> if anything. Um, uh, uh, years ago, when I was investigating human trafficking in retail banking, uh, we used to get um, groups of um, migrants coming in with a translator into the branch. Obviously, at the moment, we're not getting branch activity um, because of uh, lockdowns in various countries. Um, but even what, one thing I would look at is um, new uh, account openings. Um, I'm not singling out migrants, but something like that. If uh, a particular bank um, is seeing a flux of multiple migrants in a week, in a day, suddenly remotely opening bank accounts, or even if they're doing video calls or selfies, things like that, where there's somebody coercing them translating for them uh it's not a typology in itself but it's something to be mindful of i would say because that's how i stopped one instance uh when they were coming into branches with translators suddenly opening accounts um groups of uh, certain certain migrants were opening accounts um with very weak reasons of why they needed it so similarly remotely if we're seeing um multiple new accounts being opened uh, you know, over a short or even a long frequency, suddenly um, to look into it a bit more to see what's going on. And and certainly as uh, travel bans start to lift, we might see people flowing differently, right? That a similar surge of people trying to, yeah. to hop Looking over. for new jobs and things like that, yeah. <laughs> Bob, you had a question? Uh, I was on a call, I think, last week, and I meant to know if I were a financial institution now, um, I would be looking at uh, uh, younger clients uh, who are now receiving email money transfers that weren't in the past. And if there's a way that your analytics can be that sophisticated to look for a spike in that activity, uh, I think that's one one rule that you might consider. In Leamington and in uh, some of the other farming countries in Ontario, southwestern Ontario, uh, they've just deemed that uh, migrant workers can come up there now and considered an essential service. Traditionally, the model has been migrant workers come in and the farmer will pay them a stipend. They'll give them room and board 
and then they'll pay them a stipend. It's typically in cash. And when they go back home after the end of, this, of the farming season, they, uh, they take the cash with them. It'll be interesting to see how that changes with cash being less desirable in terms of physical notes. I know you mentioned before, I think it was Tamea, you mentioned that the funds are going perhaps more towards credit card and crypto now as we move away from cash. Thank you.